Okay, I said earlier that this really is not a, a discussion about neutral versus mass, and it's not a discussion of high versus low arches. It's really a discussion of single axis versus postural change. And that's really how, how the future of biomechanics will be framed. And I said this was a paradigm shift, and what did I mean? Well, you really have to decide whether you're going to go with a single axis model, which defines a rotational position around one axis, which gives you a fairly generic shaped orthotic because it has to leave room for the modifications, treats you near the end of the range of motion in pronation, and then applies a bunch of mods, tilts, grooves, lumps and bumps, flanges, skives, wedges, pads, and cushions. And studies are showing a fairly negligible kinematic change. And mass posture, which is really an all-axis model, deals with a postural change instead of a rotational position. Instead of being a generic shape, it's the actual shape of the foot, which I think is not a bad thing. Therefore, it gives it full contact, and beyond that, has the soft tissues compressed. and allows you to apply a much greater corrective force because it's calibrated, and is full contact gives you no hot spots, and an even distribution of force through the entire orthotic. And like I said, the force is actually measured. We actually measure it on every single orthosis. And we try to get a visible change, in, a visible functional change. So what is the future of biomechanics? First thing is research. We love research. We fund research. I am so excited because I think I'm going to be able to fund some research here. Uh, first time I went to the Smithsonian, we had the crudest thing. We took an old Hewlett Packard paper tray and we made a 27 degree angle and we held calcanei, we looked at 210 of them, and measured the angulation of each of the three facets. We looked at ones from the Aleutian Islands pre-European contact from fourth, 12th dynasty, 4,300 years old. This is the only Neanderthal calcaneus in existence. This is 50,000 years old. It's actually from a cave in Iraq. Uh, this is Dr. Stu Curry, who's our director of research. And what we used was the Terry collection this time. I just went last month. And, and spent some time there. The Terry collection is from St. Louis. Dr. Terry started collecting bodies that weren't claimed. So if you died and you ended up in the morgue and nobody took the body, Terry got it. Every drawer has the, the head cut in half and the long bones and little bags of the feet and hands and a full medical history. And what we did this time was fascinating. We invented a device that lofts the bones into 3D. We took six separate scans, six sides of the bone, and then we used a program called Shape Fusion to fuse them together. So we ended up with 209 calcaneuses. We're going back in January to get the exact taluses that match. And we have a, a medical history on each one of these, a death certificate, and they're fascinating. Like one was actually a guy was robbing a store and he was shot by the store owner and they have a picture of him in the casket leaning against the building, the news article. <laughs> it's really a very interesting place. And by the way, these bones belong to you, and you're allowed to go and play with them. And if you haven't been backstage at the Smithsonian, it is a wonderful experience. So we took all these calcanei, and what we're looking to do is we're imposing planes on each side, vertical planes, using a computer algorithm in 3D. That allows us to size the calcanei. Once we size them, we can overlap them, and we can actually study the variation in angulation and position of each one of the facets. And we're trying to determine what the variation is. We've only been able to crunch 30 so far, and what we're finding is that there is an anatomical variation in the placement of the facets. But it is, however, a very narrow bell curve. But it does exist. We're doing some work at Quinnipiac University right now. We took 60 subject study, and this is a really interesting study. It, it goes over an entire year. We, t we did needle EMGs, force plate measurements, in-shoe pressure measurements, 
six camera system with two different styles of orthoses, comparing what are the kinematic differences from these. And this, this is a very big and expensive study. Um, but this is where we're going right now. We have, like I said, we have six engineers, and they're all working on new and interesting projects. And this is one we just finished, and we're very excited about it. It's called foot posture analysis. And what we're trying to do is create a meaningful measure of foot function. Why? The reason is, and if, you don't, if you measure something, you have the possibility of improving it. This is Six Sigma, which is the way. We're entering this digital era, and even Foot Levelers has this ridiculous scanner that gives you this result, just telling you the size of the foot. There are some wonderful pressure measurement maps that are out there. Uh, this is a more sim simplistic one. And this study is really what made me interested in foot posture analysis. Uh, and this is one of Kevin's studies. It's an excellent study. It shows the reliability and accuracy of biomechanical measurements of the lower extremity. And they looked at 17 different measurements. And 15 of the measurements that we use in the static biomechanical examination, unfortunately, have very poor inter-rated reliability, 0 0.5 or less. The remaining two had 0.6, which is still not clinically significant. But one of them was relaxed calcaneal stance, and the other one was forefoot varus. So the measurements we're taught to take on the foot, unfortunately, have no inter-rated reliability. What does that mean? You say it's varus, he says it's valgus. <laughs> it's diff it's not, not good. Then Tom McPoyle, this guy always throws a wrench in the works. He, he studies calcaneal bisection and calcaneal movement, inversion, eversion, and see if it has any relationship to the gait cycle. Do static measurements taken off weight bearing tell you anything about how you walk? It turns out it doesn't. So our static measurements are not only inaccurate, unreliable, but insignificant. They have no significance. So what do we have left, x-rays? Well, my question is, what posture was the foot, was the foot in when the x-ray was taken? It's a two-dimensional shadow, and we have to know what posture it is before we know if it has any significance, and we don't know that. So x-rays aren't so good, <laughs> unfortunately. So what's left? We're in trouble <laughs> biomechanically. We don't have a good measurement other than if you happen to own a gate lab, <laughs> which, is, which is, I'm jealous. <laughs> you guys have great stuff. And we said, what if? What if instead of looking at two dimensions, we started looking at three. What if instead of looking at a singular posture, we looked between postures across time? And we took two specific postures. The most supination that a foot could be in with heel and forefoot on the ground, mass position, and relaxed calcaneal stance, and compared them. And we invented this device, which is the same device we used at the Smithsonian, only larger, and you put a cast in, you pull this drawer out, and you slide it in, it's not real fancy. And what it does is it's web driven. You put a patient in, you can look for an old patient or a new patient. You do the two different casts. Casting in mass posture, you have to do a nine step process that we teach. Casting in relaxed calcaneal stance is easy. You just stand in the foam the way chiropractors do. <laughs> you know? That's as so we got as bad a posture as you could get and as good. And then we passed the lasers over it and using two webcams we're able to loft into 3D. We didn't invent that. It was actually a, a university in Germany that invented it and we just funded it <laughs> once again and got what's called the APIs, the application pr program interfaces that allowed us to go in and manipulate the program. And what we were able to do when we look at this is we can look at a foot corrected and uncorrected and first measure the navicular drop. Turns out navicular drop statistically is shown to be a fairly good indicator of foot posture. It's fairly reliable. The only trouble is it's such a small amount it's hard to measure accurately. This allows you to measure it accurately. But then my, I have to say my son is a computer programmer. And we were sitting around one day, he and I, doing trigonometry, big father and son thing. <laughs> and what do we do? 
we start looking at ratios of the sines of the angles from the, of the first metatarsal to the floor, corrected versus not corrected. And it turns out if you take a ratio of the sines of the angles, and I can go over the math with you, but it's not, not that bad, really. You can actually calculate the percentage reduction of tension that is possible in the plantar fascia. What does that mean? It means for the first time in history, you can tell a patient before they get an orthotic, this orthotic will work, or this orthotic won't work. And that's pretty nice. Say, before you spend $500, how would you like to know it's going to work? So, and this is pretty cool. We then fixed it up so that you could go full screen and see the foot, corrected and not corrected, in the full screen. And some of these are supposed to be animations. Let's see if this is. Yeah, there it is. Uh, Maybe it's not. Well, let's go into the future. Here's the cool thing about it. You walk, you walk, patient comes in, you say, it looks like you might have a biomechanical problem. I'd like to do a test. You immediately take the two casts of the foot. You put them in. Send the information. You've already casted the foot. So you already have the cast of the foot. You don't have to redo it. Comes back. You now know whether the orthotic is going to be able to reduce tension on the plantar fascia or not. Then, this is the cool part. You give the patient, you can go full screen and show the patient their foot, corrected, not corrected, compared, and then you hand them a URL, a username and password, and they go home with it, and they bring it up on their home computer. Why did I do that? My kids are of the age right now that when they come home from college, dad, dad, I, I want to show you this YouTube video. I want to show you everything's about the computer nowadays. They all gather around the computer. That's the, that's the future. And I wanted people to be able to show other patients, so your patients show all their friends what you're doing and how their foot changes. Then what happens when they click home on the, it doesn't go to us, we don't care, it goes to you to your home page. So now the patient could learn, ab learn about you and refer patients to you.